the cauldron of the Middle East, the Israeli Air Force has forged one of the most skilled fighting units in the history of aerial warfare. Often outnumbered, the Israelis have tallied more victories in the modern dogfight than any other air force. Now, with remarkable computer animation, you're in the cockpit with the best of the IAF. As Mirage 3 and F-15 fighters slug it out with combat-tested MiGs. Experience the battle, dissect the tactics, relive the dogfights of the Middle East. June 7, 1967, the Six-Day War. Three Israeli Mirage fighters streak towards the southern tip of the Sinai Peninsula. The Israelis, threatened with hostile armies massed on their borders, have made lightning strikes against the Soviet-equipped Arab air forces. Now they're battling across a broad front in Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. Lieutenant Giora Rome is flying number three. Suddenly, GCI, ground controlled intercept, crackles over the radio. Israeli troops in the strategic mountain pass of Bir Gafkafa are under attack by MiG 17s. The Mirages, designed to take on enemy aircraft, jettison their external tanks and heavy load of bombs. Now they're in their element. In the fading light, Rome catches movement close to the ground. Though he's only a lieutenant, Giora Rome is supremely confident and very aggressive. He learned a valuable lesson two days earlier, the first time he encountered a MiG. I was in a very convenient position to shoot him down, but my number one told me, move aside, I'm going to shoot him down. And I, as a very young pilot, and a very disciplined pilot at that time, moved aside and he shot him down. And at that moment, I said to myself, I'm not going to move aside never in my entire life. Minutes after that first disappointment, Rome kills two MiG-21s with his 30 millimeter cannon. Later that same afternoon, over Syria, he knocks a third MiG-21 out of the sky. Now, Giora Rome, the junior officer in the flight, has spotted two MiG-17s firing on Israeli troops. The MiGs are here. The Mirages are here. The young pilot will take the initiative and pitch over into a steep dive. His speed builds rapidly. He's going too fast. By the time Rome is ready to fire, he's already overtaken them. The MiGs bug out to the west. They saw me, and then they turn as a pair westward to fly back to run away to Egypt. He loops back around to chase the MiGs. Meanwhile, the other two Israeli mirages have lost sight of Rome. And they ask, where are you flying? Now you remember my story about the first MiG-21 I missed. I said to them, I am flying eastward. And I send them direction due east. He has intentionally sent his superior officers in the wrong direction. Now I'm by myself with the two MiG-17s. And 
and they're flying like about, I would say, 15 meters above the road of the middle of Sinai, very low. Rome accelerates on the deck. At this altitude, the Mirage is over 100 miles per hour faster than the MiG-17. But he's taking a beating from the MiG's jet wash. It's nearly impossible to keep his pepper on the target, but he manages to get off a shot. 30 millimeter high explosive rounds tear into the MiG. And I shot a burst at the number two. And there were black pieces coming from him all over the place. But unlike the previous MiG-21, he didn't explode. On the contrary, he raised his nose and started to climb. While number one was continuing to fly to Egypt. Rome overtakes the climbing MiG. Something was very strange because he was climbing. He did a maneuver, just climbing. And all of a sudden, I found myself in close formation with the MiG-17. I look at it. There was no canopy. There was no pilot inside. Part of the black pieces that I saw was the pilot. He ejected himself after he raised his nose. And now I was chasing a pilotless MiG-17. But after another like 10 or 15 seconds, all of a sudden he rolled on his back, his nose fell down, and he hit the ground. Lieutenant Giora Rome, against overwhelming odds, has racked up four MiGs in three days. He is one kill away from becoming Israel's first jet ace. During the 1960s, the Arab countries surrounding Israel accrued a nearly five to one superiority in numbers of combat aircraft. The venerable Russian MiG-17 was the most widely used fighter in the Arab world. Although subsonic, the MiG-17 was built like a tank and extremely maneuverable. In 1962, the Israeli Air Force acquired the French-built Mirage III as a response to advanced Russian aircraft being supplied to the Arabs. The Delta Wing Mirage was a lightweight Mach 2 fighter designed to climb quickly to altitude to intercept enemy bombers. The Mirage was an extremely versatile aircraft and the Israelis used it successfully as a fighter bomber. The Israelis acquired 72 of the new planes. Only the best fighter pilots were assigned to Mirages. The Mirage was very powerful. It was simple, it was clear to me, it was in full control, it was joyful. It was excellent. Armed originally with only radar-guided missiles, the Israelis insisted on cannon. Their air combat doctrine called for getting in close and using a gun. They would put the pipper on the adversary and they would keep it there for three seconds or two seconds that was required to do air-to-air -air gun kill. And they trained and they trained and they trained and they got very good at it. The Mirage 3 is faster and has a better rate of climb. But the slower MiG-17 can turn tighter at low altitudes and can absorb punishment. Rome has just exploited the Mirage's blistering speed to score his fourth kill. But there's one more MiG-17. And I fly very low and I try to locate him above the horizon, so I'm flying like about 700 knots and very low. And then I saw him and I was just behind him. Focused intently on his prey, Rome disregards the calls from his flight leader.
they tell me to stop and to come back on. I say, I'm going to do it in a moment. And the MiG-17 breaks all of a sudden. The MiG pilot pulls to 5,000 feet. Now it's like 6 p.m. And everyone at the Swiss Canal is looking at us and shooting at us. So there is like a pool of AAA, and there is a MiG-17, and there is myself. The Egyptian MiG begins to make sharp turns back and forth. He's trying to lure Rome into a turning fight where the MiG-17 excels. Big mistake to do it with MiG-17 when you fly Mirage because the MiG-17 flies slower than Mirage. You are doomed. What you should do is to let him fight for his life here while you take advantage of your extra energy and power. He initiates a series of high and low yo-yos. While the MiG turns horizontally, Rome uses his speed advantage to maneuver vertically, up and down, to position for a shot. So it was like five or six times where I couldn't really put my gun sight within the very steep rate of turn that he had. Every time I went up and he turned and I came down, it was like some dance over the uh, Swiss Canal. Because here you have a MiG-17, probably with a nice guy driving it. And me. Finally, he gets an opening. The pipper is on the target. Two seconds is all he needs. It's number five for Lieutenant Giora Rome. The brash 21-year-old is now Israel's first jet ace. June 5th, 1967. 119 Squadron CO Ron Ronan is leading a formation of mirages to a distant target over 600 miles away. Gardaka, an Egyptian airfield near the Red Sea, south of the Sinai Peninsula. Ronan's mission is to put the runways out of action with specially developed cratering bombs. We have eight bombs, each bomb is 500 kilos with a fuses of, it's called 712, which means the bomb got in and then explode. This is because this bay makes a big crater. Over the Red Sea, the formation drops to low level to keep the element of surprise. Navigating by compass, elapsed time, and airspeed, they approach the target area. Approaching the target, they'll pull up to 5,000 feet, roll over, and start their bomb run. 540 knots, 900 feet per second. One minute to pull. Ronan orders switches on. Final cockpit check. Five seconds to pull. Ready, ready. Stick back, nose up 50 degrees, full afterburner. The altimeter spins clockwise to 4,000 feet. Suddenly, out of the right side of the canopy, Gardaka appears. So does the triple A. The moment I pulled, they started shooting. It was unbelievable. The mirages roll in. The pilots swallow their fear and concentrate on the bomb run. The bombs impact precisely, rendering the runway useless. 
the Mirages press the attack, crisscrossing the field. Then, number three, the second most experienced pilot in the flight, calls bingo fuel, his limit to return safely home. Ronan must continue the bombing mission with only three Mirages. Ronan leads two and four, who are new pilots, on another strafing pass. Suddenly, four shouts in near panic for Ronan to take evasive action. Then I heard number four say, one break, somebody behind you. I look around and saw MiG-19, very close to me. If you see an airplane firing on you, it's OK, because the bullets cross you behind you. When you see his bottom, his bottom here, and if I go here, a big problem. The MiG is pulling hard, trying to get his nose pointed in front of Ronan's Mirage to lead him with gunfire. Ronan must force the MiG to overshoot. He will pitch his nose up, then roll over the top and let the MiG pass beneath him. Then he'll descend right on the MiG's tail. It's a classic Israeli tactic called let him pass. The MiG overshoots. Ronan drops down on his six o'clock. The Egyptian knows it is about to end. I got behind him 300 meter or less, and within no time, I uh, pulled the trigger and shot him. And he crashed into the base. Ronan's Mirage is suddenly alone in the sky. One MiG is down, but Ronan knows that MiGs hunt in packs. The fight over Gardaka is not over. Egyptian air bases were the primary objective of the Israeli Air Force on the first day of the Six-Day War. The plan was called Operation Moked, or FOCUS. On June 5, 1967, during five furious hours, the Israelis destroyed over 400 Arab aircraft on the ground. In response, the Egyptians put many of their remaining aircraft on airborne alert. A flight of these MiGs has just ambushed Ron Ronan's mirages. In the engagement, Ronan has lost sight of his wingmen. Then I ask, uh, uh, where are you, the other two? Ronan's number two gives his location. Ronan is here. His number two is here, on the tail of a MiG-19. But Ronan sees another MiG-19 moving into position to bounce him. Ronan slams the throttle forward. It was four airplanes, a MiG, Mirage, a MiG, and myself. Number two must quickly make his kill. The MiG is closing. So I um, called him in again uh, and tried to, uh, to convince him to hurry up. After a seeming eternity, the MiG in front bursts into a shower of flaming debris. Ronan orders his number two to break away out of the fight. With cool efficiency, Ron Ronan bores in on his second kill of the day. I close behind him and, uh, you know, put the people on the cockpit and again pull the trigger, 
and shut him down. And he spinned into the base. One of Ronan's cubs is safe, but the second has to be accounted for. Number four reports he's south of the base, hot on the tail of another MiG-19. Then I looked and saw this is more, this is maybe the most, one of the most strange pictures I've ever seen. It's an almost surreal sight. A MiG-19 attempting to land on a bombed out runway with Ronan's number four wallowing at low speed behind him. The young pilot's eagerness for the kill has nearly spelled his demise. He's riding the throttle, struggling to stay behind the descending MiG. The Mirage is on the verge of stalling. It was a young pilot, very dedicated pilot. His four MiG was so excited. Ronan must get four to abandon the chase, lower his nose, and add power without panic. Then, in a very calm voice, he told him, OK, leave him. Leave the airplane. Leave the airplane to the right, carefully to the right, full power. Four gains momentum, levels out, and banks away. Ronan pulls abreast of the landing MiG. Runway, a huge crater looms up like the open jaws of a monster. The Egyptian pilot is either fatally confused or suicidal. Ronan banks away from the funeral pyre that is now Gardaka. Three mirages barely make it back to base on fumes. They have completely paralyzed Gardaka and accounted for four MiGs. Not a bad day's work. August 16, 1966. Ten months before the start of the Six Day War, two gleaming mirages climb steeply through the clear skies of central Israel on a secret mission. After three days of standby alert, the planes have been quickly sent aloft. Even the lead pilot, Lieutenant Colonel Ron Ronan, doesn't know why they've been scrambled or where they're headed. Within seconds, the tower orders the mirages to make a left turn Heading 090. Ronan can't believe his ears. They're sending him toward Jordan, the opposite direction from their most hostile enemy, Egypt. Ronan requests confirmation. The tower repeats the order, 090 at full power, adding the Hebrew phrase, Lemiv Gosh. Be every one word is in Ibu Lemivgash, two intersections, which means there is a target identifying, and you have all the green lights to, uh, you know, to intercept it and to kill. Unsure of what lay ahead, Ronan tells his wingman, switches on, pilot shorthand to arm his 30 millimeter cannon and missiles. Then, over the radio comes an unexpected voice. Air Force Commander General Mahdi Ha speaking directly to Ronan. They run. You will see in a few minutes something that you are not authorized to shut down. I said, Roger. Ha tells Ronan to watch his 11 o'clock. Suddenly, I saw a black dot on the horizon. And it started to turn left, left, and then 
till I was in a 90 degree, and I say a silhouette of aeroplane. The shroud of mystery and secrecy has suddenly dropped away, revealing a silver prize glinting in the clear blue sky. It's a MiG-21 that has defected from Iraq, the subject of secret intelligence reports. No Israeli has ever laid eyes on the most advanced airplane in the Arab world, until now. It was like unbelievable, impossible. This is not a dream, but this is, a, you know, a, something that the, beyond your imagination. The Israelis pulled off a major coup, and that was to have the Mossad entice an Iraqi Christian pilot to bring a then brand new MiG-21F to Israel. Ronan's awe at the sight of the MiG is tempered by the threat of the unknown. This gleaming cobra still has fangs. And then I told my number two, you be sitting 250 meters behind you. Gun sight on him. Switches on, be ready. Ronan approaches the MiG cautiously, wary of any sudden movements. I thought maybe this is a kamikaze, maybe this is a trap. I left my two ends on the stick and the throttle in case you break, in case something, then I can. It was a little bit higher, very close, 10 meters less. And then he saw me and I made like that. He answered me. He answered me, my two hands on the stick and the throttle, and he answered me. Only then I raised my left hand and he answered me. Then I told him, you go after me. You, he said, okay, and like that, and I led him. With Ronan flying off the MiG's wing, it is number two with thumb on the trigger. The remarkable three-ship formation heads back to Israel. Danny Shapira, Israel's chief test pilot, can't believe the news. The pilot said to me, hey, you know, just an hour ago, a MiG-21 landed in Chatzor. Probably you will be the one to fly. I, I thought they were joking, you know. I said, ah, don't give me that boot. But the next morning, he's in front of General Mahdi Had. He looked at me, you know, smiled, and he said, look, Danny, you're going to be the first Western pilot in the world to fly a MiG-21. I said, well, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. This is actual footage of Shapira inspecting the MiG-21. Shapira is briefed by the Iraqi pilot. Russian and Arabic writing in the cockpit is replaced with English and Hebrew. And within only a few days, Shapira closes the canopy and lifts the MiG-21 smoothly into the bright Mediterranean sky. I didn't have any problem. The rate of flying was excellent. The airplane was lighter. At least 2,000, 2,200 pounds, less than, uh, than a Mirage. After becoming familiar with the airplane, Shapira, and only Shapira, begins flying against senior Israeli fighter pilots. We made a program to train our pilots and see how a MiG-21 maneuvers and what a Mirage has to do in order to stay behind of a MiG-21 and shoot it down. We conducted 120 flights and, you know, uh, practiced against them to see the airplane, to be familiar with the airplane, to see in several different uh, silhouettes. And it was amazing. The Israelis learned that the MiG-21 is light and fast. But at high speed and low altitude, the control surfaces become sluggish and unresponsive. Worst of all, the airplane has terrible rear visibility. So I said to them, if you go down slightly, 500 feet below the MiG, he'll never see you. you if, if you see a MiG doing this, 
It means that he's looking for you. He doesn't see you, but he's looking for you. Once he starts to turn, get in and shoot. But the Israelis also come to appreciate the airplane's essential Russian qualities, especially the ease of maintenance. It's like what we said at the time, it's like a Volkswagen. Fuel and go, fuel and go, and again and again. One of the things about the Russians is they learned how to design an aircraft in a high, efficient, low-cost manner. They didn't even have flush riveting, and some of the seams were really rough. But who cares? It still can go Mach 2, and it was efficient, it was fast, it was maneuverable. And if it doesn't last more than a couple days in combat, make it cheap. The intelligence coup helped the Israelis devise winning tactics during the Six-Day War. Israeli pilots destroy 58 enemy aircraft in air-to-air -air combat against a loss of 10 of their own. A remarkable achievement. Over the next decade, these airmen will hone their fighting skills in the turmoil of Middle East conflict. June 27, 1979. Over Lebanon, near Sidon, the base of operations for PLO terrorist activity in the region. Four Israeli F-15s from 133 Squadron speed due east toward a rendezvous with history. The F-15 is a fighter pilot's dream. Powerful, maneuverable, lethal. The Israelis only half-jokingly call them flying SAM sites because of the airplane's big radar and all the weapons it carries. Eight missiles, four radar-guided and four heat-seeking. And 940 rounds of high-explosive ammunition for its 20-millimeter Gatling gun. This is the first time the F-15 has been in combat anywhere in the world. The four-ship, led by Colonel Benny Zinker, is alerted by GCI that Syrian MiGs have crossed into Lebanese airspace from the east. The F-15s break hard. Major Moshe Melnik is flying off Zinker's wing as his number two. He opened afterburner and uh, concentrate in the radar. He got immediate lock on the, on the mix, and uh, very, very fast they were in range of uh, launching. The MiGs are almost 20 miles away, but the F-15 has been designed for BVR, beyond visual range combat. The F-15's enormous radar has found the targets and fed the information to its AIM-7 missiles. Now um, uh, we got uh, permission from the GCI to open uh, fire, but uh, usually you are waiting uh, till the leader gives you also uh, his permission. And uh, I waited. I, I, I was wondering why Benny Singer is not giving uh, us permission to open fire because I, I've seen on my radar that we are in range. Seconds into the F-15's first armed confrontation, Moshe Melnik knows why his leader, Benny Zinker, has not cleared him to fire. Both men want the first kill. So actually, I, sh I pressed the, the pickle button, uh, the launch button, almost the same time, almost the same tenth of, the se of a second. And uh, both missiles, both F-7 missiles, uh, were launched together and uh, like, uh, like a formation. Two radar-guided sparrows streak away from the F-15s at Mach 3. And we waited, and it was a marvelous sight to see the missiles going together in a formation, the, the mountains, the horizon, blue skies, and we waited, and nothing happened. In the first ever attempt at an F-15 BVR kill, the sparrows fail to lock and streak harmlessly into space. We were amazed, we were shocked. Already an ace in the F-4 Phantom, Melnick instinctively reverts to time-honored dogfighting tactics. He gets his head outside the cockpit. I went back to the old habits, uh, 
good sight, good look outside, not anymore on the radar scope. The MiGs, aware that they've come up against the most powerful fighter in Middle Eastern skies, turn back towards Syria. The maneuver exposes their hot tailpipes to Melnik's heat-seeking Python missiles. They are turning right in front of us, from in, uh, right to left, right in front of us like this. Melnik gets first tally on the MiGs. The Python 3, an advanced Israeli version of the American AIM-9 Sidewinder, is growling into his headset. Suddenly, the MiGs reverse. In the middle of this reverse of the turn, I launch my missile. Melnik is cranked past 130 degrees to stay with the MiGs. The Python is an all-aspect missile and can take the G. There is no ejection. Within the span of 30 seconds, Melnik has made history. An Israeli has taken first blood for the F-15. The F-15, built by McDonnell Douglas, was the first American aircraft since the F-86, designed specifically for air-to-air -air combat. In 1976, Israel became the first country outside the United States to acquire the Mach 2 air superiority fighter. First flight I made in the F-15 was like my first solo in life. The, the I mean the excitement and, and joyfulness and it was great. Over Lebanon, 133 Squadron is battling Syrian MiG-21s and scored the world's first two F-15 kills. Now, Eitan Ben Eliyahu is going to go head to head with a third. It's the one airplane, which was number four in their formation, flew directly head on to me, and he was passing by me. This was the one versus one engagement. The MiG and the F 15 pass in a classic merge. Then each turns hard to get on the other's tail. Ben Eliyahu finds himself in a high G turning fight, an arena in which the Israelis dominate. Once he engaged, when he passed by me, he had no other choice but to engage with me. And I had no other choice but to kill him. The MiG can't sustain a level high G turn. He noses down to keep his energy up, descending rapidly. Eliyahu is on him like glue, his powerful F-100 turbofan engines providing unmatched thrust in the turn. So after two and a half turns, very close to each other, he was looking for the right second to escape. He had no choice. We were close to the ground. He had to roll out. It's too close for even a heat-seeking missile. Ben Eliyahu goes to guns to deliver the classic Israeli coup de grace. The minute a little bit he rolled out, I did another pull and I was right after him, 600 yards, 650 yards. The M61 Gatling gun, nestled in the F-15's right wing, spews out 20-millimeter ammunition at 6,000 rounds per minute. All I had to do is to squeeze the trigger two times. shots and it's gone. He took the only gunshot kill uh, at this combat. We were envy by the way because we appreciate gunshot kill much more than everything else. 
he was the hero of this engagement because, because he brought a gunshot kill like it should be in, the, in our books. What's interesting about this engagement is it ended up where several Syrian MiG-21s were shot down. F-15 pilots used a mix of weapons. This included uh, radar-guided sparrows, IR-guided missiles, and a cannon kill. The F-15 was clearly master of the skies over Lebanon. The Israelis made a point, which is that I still retain air superiority in this region, and if you attempt to mess with my strike operations, you'll pay for it. The F-15's sophisticated radar and electronics suite have been continuously updated and modernized. 50 Syrian MiGs have fallen to F-15 since 1979. Without a single combat loss to Israel. The F-15 established not only air superiority in the region, but air dominance. This was enhanced in 1980 with the arrival of the F-16, a lightweight dogfighter that can also put bombs on target with incredible accuracy. Advanced models of both aircraft are now in service with the Israeli Air Force. But with the near certainty that Syria has acquired the agile Mach 2 MiG-29 with its advanced avionics, Israel has been leading the development of new technology for air combat. The Python 4 and 5 from Rafael may be the world's most advanced all-aspect infrared missiles. When combined with new cockpit avionics, the result is a revolution in dogfighting tactics. Elbit Systems leads the world in the design of helmet-mounted sights that enable the fighter pilot to simply look at a target to aim his weapons. During the 1967 war, it might take 30 seconds for a pilot to maneuver into a position where he can shoot another aircraft down with a gun. At that time, he has to look around and make sure that there's no other airplane engaging him. Today, in a similar engagement, Within five to 10 seconds, you might be able to look to the left, to the right, detect the target, fire the missile, and kill the airplane. Given the history of violence in the region, Israeli pilots will continue to fly on the edge for the foreseeable future.